I, I shall say a few brief words, but a very brief. I think my understanding is that we have the room just for one hour. Yeah. Um, so I want to I won't waste much of it. I should also add now, if anybody wants to join afterwards for a little drink or dinner or do something more, further discussions, um, yeah, everybody is very welcome. Um, I'm Lutz Martin. I'm half in the Africa section, half the linguistics section. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Tanya Kuteba, who is a well-known guest here. So she's a research associate of the department for many years now. She's been here many times. There was interruption during COVID where we couldn't travel, so we kept in touch online. But now I think this is the first time you're back in London after, after a while, really. That's true. Um, Since uh, last year. Yes. Oh, no, you were here last year. That's true. Yeah. But still, but we're sort of a gathering place. Um, Tanya is in the English department at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, so her, her background is in English linguistics, but she has worked extensively across a range of languages, in particular on the theories of grammatization, language change, language contact, and she is a you know, very well-known person in the field. Um, one, of the, one of the books I really like is work with Bernd Heine on uh, language change and language contact in 2005, and um, you've also got on auxiliaries quite extensively, um, and most recently on discourse grammar or interactional grammar. I think you also talked a little bit about that in that talk. Um, with that, I think I leave the floor to Tanya. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. It's also actually the inaugural talk of the new um, linguistic seminar series. We're going to continue Wednesdays every two weeks, I think we're saying, um, to have groups of speakers. Um, and so it's really nice to start the series with Tanya. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I'm always delighted to be back. And thanks a lot for this wonderful uh, introduction, Ruth. Um, well, so this is uh, actually a very, very much of a pilot study. Uh, it is a joint study with um, my two Korean co-authors, Professor Song Pan Lee and um, Professor uh, Sun Hee Yae. Uh, then uh, Sarah Gane is um, uh, somebody from, uh, she's a scholar from uh, Isfahan University. Iran and also associated with the Heinrich Heine uh, University in Dusseldorf, which is also the university at which I am based. Um, and Dana Chandra Menendez, um, who is associated with the Heinrich Heine uh, University. Uh, as you can see, I mean, we have several uh, quite different languages here. I mean, we have native speakers of Korean, myself, Bulgarian. Um, then Persian, and then Dana uh, is a speaker of um, Spanish uh, and uh, Indonesian. So she's a bilingual speaker. Right, so um, it's a very fearful title, Fear Across Languages. Um, let me very quickly uh, walk you through the structure of, of the presentation. Um, after a brief introduction, uh, we will talk about the theoretical preliminaries that uh, we're using in this study. Uh, then we'll take a look at the expression of fear across languages in uh, what we have termed sentence grammar. And then uh, it will be interactive grammar. Maybe these two terms are new for you, so I'll take uh, some time to uh, explain them. Uh, and then we'll uh, go to section five, uh, in which we'll try to give you a, a bigger picture uh, about how the emotion of fear um, is expressed uh, in language. And then we'll come to the uh, conclusion section. Um, so here, we, I mean, uh, in the literature, there have been two uh, major theories of uh, emotions or two major views on, on emotions. On the one hand, we have uh, the so I mean the classical uh, view of emotions, which was um, propo uh, proposed by Paul Ekman and his associates uh, decades ago, uh, according to which there are at least five so-called basic emotions. Uh, of course, you can all guess, I mean, for, for us in, in, in Western, uh, I mean, here in this part of the, of the globe, um, at least joy uh, and uh, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. At least these two are considered to be uh, basic in this um, uh, framework. And interestingly enough, each of these emotions that is claimed <clears throat> has a distinct 
fingerprint or signature. So what does that mean? It means that um, each of these emotions is experienced in the same way. And not only is it experienced in the same way by all human beings, but also um, the representation of these, uh, of each of these emotions is uh, universal. So the same facial expression uh, is used to express uh, each of them, fear included, uh, everywhere in the world. And these are recognizable everywhere in the world. Um, this view, the classical view of emotions, predicts that each basic emotion correlates uh, with a particular body-related physiological pattern. Thank you very much, Lutz. Um, physiological pattern of behavior uh, and also a particular brain activity circuitry. <clears throat> Now, opposing to this is the more recent uh, so-called construction theory of emotions, which has been elaborated by Lisa feldman Barrett and her associates uh, in a number of actually over 200 uh, articles and more recently uh, in two books, um, one in 2017, how emotions are made the secret life of the brain, and uh, the more recent one, 2020, uh, seven and a half lessons of the of, about the brain. So according to this uh, theory, uh, the standpoint taken is actually radically different here. Namely, uh, emotions are not universal. There are no basic emotions. Uh, I mean, there are no universal so-called basic emotions. What an emotion is, is different for different people and different cultures. In some cultures, there is no real distinction between thinking and feeling. And actually, I'm going to, um, to give you um, uh, an excerpt uh, from an interview with Elizabeth Barrett several months ago, uh, which I think is very interesting. So what she says is, not everybody has emotions. Even more shockingly, in some cultures, there is no real distinction between thinking and feeling. In such cultures, thoughts and feelings are part of a unified whole experience. There is no distinction between them. And actually, the neuroscience seems to suggest that that's probably more correct. So I can already see on you know, my expressions on your face. This is extremely counterintuitive, isn't it? Um, anyway, in her work, and also the work of her associates, there is this attempt uh, to build, a, let's call it a window on emotions from the perspective of psychological neuroscience. Okay, we are linguists and as linguists, um, uh, the question is, can we, from a linguistics point of view, also have some kind of a window on um, on the reality of, on emotions. So our goal here is to test the classical and the construction theory of emotions, these two theories, opposing theories, from a linguistic perspective. As you can imagine, uh, this turned out to be an extremely humbling experience. Very intriguing, fascinating area of research, but very, very challenging and difficult. And I have to say once again, it is very much a pilot study. So the question that uh, we are asking here is, does the linguistic realization of emotions support the view that they're universal, that each has a distinct fingerprint as the classical view would have it, or are they cultural constructs uh, as is, uh, um, um, 
uh, argued uh, in the construction theory of emotions. Uh, object of investigation here is one particular emotion uh, which has traditionally assumed to be basic and universal and also automatically triggered, uh, namely fear, hence the title. Our basic assumption Emotions and cognition cannot be separated. This is not even an assumption that has been established already in a number of works. So they're together, emotions and cognition. But we assume that cognition is manifested by language, also somehow very ready, <laughs> ready is a very ready assumption to make. We assume that language reflects how we conceptualize the world and language reflects cognition and emotion, since they cannot be separated anyway, fear included. But is this the whole story or only half of it? Does language play a crucial role in how we conceptualize the world and how we experience or construct emotions? Our claim is that from a linguistic point of view, the emotion of fear has no specific fingerprint, rather variation is the norm. Because what we observe is that different expressions can be used to express the same emotion. And the same expression can be used to express different emotions. So to this extent, the expression of fear in language is compatible with the construction theory of emotions. There is a caveat. The variation in the linguistic expression of fear is not unconstrained. It's not a random mess, nevertheless. So let me now very quickly go through the um, theoretical preliminaries, through the theoretical concepts that we'll be using uh, here. So um, the concepts that I need to introduce at this point are uh, three, actually. Discourse grammar. This, for us, discourse grammar is uh, the overall amount of all um, um, uh, linguistic resources that are available uh, for constructing sp uh, spoken, signed, or written texts everything that language users have at their disposal. And within this everything, within this overall amount of linguistic expressions, we make a distinction between two domains of linguistic organization, namely on the one hand sentence grammar, and on the other hand thetical grammar. This is a distinction that we made in several works since 2008 and 11, actually, that the first work was that uh, came from no, I came here in 2009, so, but it was, I think 2011 is the first publication that we had on this particular theoretical framework. And um, so here you have a, a, in figure one, a sketch of discourse grammar. Uh, as I said, uh, this is about a linguistic organization operating on at least two different plays, sentence grammar on the one hand and thetical grammar. Uh, and uh, sentence grammar is uh, actually, you know, what is uh, the, the, the object of investigation in mainstream uh, linguistic literature. Um, it, it's organized in terms of parts of speech and constituent types, sentences, words, morphemes, etc., and the um, synta syntactical and morphological rules that relate them. And thetical grammar comprises uh, thetical categories, and they can be a word, um, a phrase, a clause, or chunk of, uh, of text, which is extra clausal which is uh, independent from the uh, clause structure. Um, here we distinguish between three types. Uh, they can be instantaneous, they can be constructional and formulaic. For us, um, what will be relevant is the, the last uh, type, uh, third type, formulaic uh, theticals. 
Um, so this is the contents of what has been also proposed and uh, elaborated um, most recently in uh, uh, the framework of interactive grammar, uh, which uh, Bert Heine is, um, uh, 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 has uh, uh, proposed, uh, and it will uh, come out in uh, the Oxford University Press in 2023. So we'll be talking about discourse grammar, uh, sorry, we'll be talking about, actually, we'll take a look at sentence grammar and then interactive grammar, because th this is, uh, you know, about, these are the planes um, at which uh, linguistic, we can expect linguistic realization of the emotion of fear. But um, we come now to interactive grammar as a distinct domain of language organization. Uh, with an interactive grammar, uh, Bert Heine makes a distinction between 10 main types of interactives. So you, you have expressions which are attention signals like, hey, uh, directives, shh, uh, discourse markers, for example, indeed, evaluatives, great, brilliant, ideal thoughts, thought, interjections, ouch, wow, um, response, response um, elicitors, right? Um, response signals, yes, no. Uh, social formulae, like bye, bye bye. <laughs> Vocatives, like mom, sir, uh, ladies and gentlemen, etc. So, as you can see, there's quite some diversity here, even though they differ, however, uh, each of these can occur on their own. So they're not integrated into the causal structure. Um, they are extra causal uh, constituents. And here's the definition of interactives. An interactive is an invariable deictic form. Why deictic? Because it is embedded in a concrete discourse pragmatic situation. So an interactive is an invariable the ictic form that is in some way set off from the surrounding text semantically, syntactically, and prosodically, and can neither be negated nor questioned. So you cannot, <laughs> you cannot negate it or put it into a question. Um, now, we're passing on to um, the linguistic expression of fear. And first, we'll take a look at sentence grammar, the, the ordinary, the orthodox uh, grammar. Uh, so what do we find across languages? We find um, what we have termed transparent or straightforward fear morphemes, right? Like in English, you have words like to fear, to be frightened of, to be afraid of, to have fear of, for fear of. So it's, it's fear, afraid, these are the, the lexical, uh, the lexemes. Um, in English, fear can be expressed in different word classes. Uh, you can have it as a noun, a terrible fear struck his heart, adjective, he was afraid, uh, a verb, John feared Mary. In French, uh, well, this is an example of uh, no fewer than 16 different lexemes for different subtypes of fear. Of course, here we can, you can say that this is a language with, with a very high granularity of the emotion of fear. Very, very fine distinctions. Uh, my favorite ones are, you can even have a fear of books, also a fear of knowledge and even fear of beautiful women. <laughs> but of course, as you can imagine, if we go to that level of specificity, right, which is a very low level of generality, uh, of course you can expect uh, a, you know, a large number of words for fear. But we are actually interested um, in basic level, uh, so to say, notion, basic level, uh, uh, in expressions of fear, uh, basic level expressions. Um, so even if we look at basic level categories of fear, the way that they're expressed in language, even then, 
uh, even in related, in closely related languages, geographically and genetically, we see that um, languages can behave differently regarding the way that they encode fear. For instance, in English, you have the basic level word fear. In German, for fear, you have two counterparts for, for, for English fear. You have Angst and Furcht. Um, and um, here I have, you know, because uh, Lutz, uh, Lutz came to Dusseldorf several months ago and he gave a wonderful lecture with, uh, with an analysis of, um, of the expressions of fear in Bantu languages. And here I have um, selected uh, five different lexemes that Lutz identified in Swahili um, that express fear. So you can see how the adjective be fearful, then from that adjective, um, there is a noun derived, uh, then uh, there is a verb derived, but then there is a totally different lexeme, cha, which is to fear, to revere, uh, then we have another different um, uh, lexeme, fear, be scared, be frightened, and then you have two more words, uh, two uh, nouns, which are loan words from Arabic, right? So you see, there is a difference in the number of fear as basic level notions. So this is what we observe when it comes to straightforward or transparent, so to say, expressions of fear. Um, now, very often, fear is expressed by, by means of body uh, of expressions, which are somehow related to the body, to the physiology or to body parts, right? Um, so these are also called physiological metonymies, right? So a number of linguistic expressions of fear relate to the physiology of the human body. Frequently, it is verbs like tremble, shiver, uh, that uh, we find in, in such expression. Now we have a Chinese <laughs> speaker here and also another one, all right. Um, but anyway, as you see, I mean, one, uh, this is a, a, a co-author from another book, from another study, Hai Ping Long. So he gave us this example, it should be correct, right? <laughs> um, so you see, um, in, in Mandarin Chinese, you, you can use um, the verb for tremble, um, as well. And um, interestingly, body uh, uh, related expressions, which involve physiological states like trembling and shivering, they can encode fear, but it's not only fear. Uh, often, uh, it is also another uh, negative uh, emotion, namely anger. It's really very, very often the case now. Uh, this is why people speak of fears and angers. There was a conference several years ago at Queen Mary, and just the whole conference was on fears and angers. <laughs> um, so this is really something that you find very often. One of the same linguistic expression can, uh, can, can stand either for fear or for anger. And here is again our uh, Mandarin uh, Chinese example, uh, where you can say that being so angry that one is trembling, of course, I dare not <laughs> use my Mandarin pronunciation, <laughs> just because uh, it will be a fiasco. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the expression. Um, but it's not only fears and angers, both of which are negative expressions. It is also very often the case that one is the because the expression which stands for something as negative and as fear and anger also can encode a positive emotion, something like excitement, like joy. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting. Positive emotions can also be encoded by uh, expressions for fear. Now, even more commonly, uh, linguistic expressions for fear relate to body part terms, to body parts or, or liquids in the body. Um, very often you find expressions which uh, um, involve uh, the heart, uh, then um, the skin, very often goosebumps, um, body fluids such as blood, uh, sweat. Um, so in Germany you have Gänsehaut bekommen, 
uh, to get goosebumps. Uh, in Korean, it is, um, it's not goose, <laughs> it's chicken. <laughs> so, some kind of poultry, right? Um, to get goosebumps, chicken skin. Uh, in Chinese, as far as I recall, it is also chicken, isn't it? Right. Um, so, irrespective of the kind of poultry, the no, it's, it's the same notion, roughness of the skin, right? Which is foregrounded. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, fear expressions which involve body part or liquid, or liquid terms, they vary a lot across uh, languages. With respect to the body parts that are involved, I think in, in Mandarin Chinese there was something about uh, intestines and, 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 and very, very, very expressive intestines and stomach. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't, uh, I couldn't include also this example, but very interesting. Um, and there is also variation when it comes to the number of body parts that a particular language chooses to, to use in this uh, phraseological uh, expressions, in this uh, yeah, linguistic expressions. And Korean is a champion here for the time being, where you can have no fewer than 16 body part terms, um, which uh, are well, I have three slides with the examples, but I'm not going to give you the concrete examples here. Uh, suffice, uh, let me just uh, mention the, the body part terms. It's about hair, hamstring, bone, sweat, all four limbs, lips, teeth, tongue, jaw, back of neck, body, hands, spine, heart, liver, and the knee. Right, and then of course, I mean, so you see, languages uh, make different choices. We don't have time for the concrete examples from Korea. Now, metaphors of fear. It is possible to, to identify metaphors, I mean, metaphorical expressions that language, languages have at their disposal in order to, to express fear. Uh, a very common metaphor, at least in Western cultures, is uh, fear is fluid in a container. Um, an example would be um, in English, the sight filled him with fear. In Turkish, you have something very similar. Uh, so in order for you to say, I'm filled with fear, you would use uh, fear in the instrumental case and then, um, you know, the verb fulfill, first person, singular, present. Um, now, it turns out that metaphors of fear are based on cultural schemata. There is a lot of variation also to be observed across languages here. Majid in 2012, a very nice study on emotions, points out that so a language spoken in the highlands of Taiwan, uh, this is a language which has, which makes very little use of metaphors um, um, in as a, for emotions in principle, and this metaphor, fear is a liquid in a container, just does not exist in, in soul. Um, there is quite a variation of, I, I, I mean, when it comes to metaphorical expressions uh, of fear, but now, uh, now we're passing on to the expression of fear still, we're still within sentence grammar, but we're looking now, uh, at the domain of grammar, grammaticalized expressions until now, it was all the lexicon, right? The transparent lexical morphemes, then we had body part term, uh, phraseological units, uh, metaphors. Now we're looking at grammatical categories. Are there grammatical categories in, uh, in the first place? Grammatical categories that encode fear? Interestingly enough, there is such a grammatical uh, category. Um, it has been um, uh, termed, uh, it's actually a misnomer, apprehensional, apprehensionals. We speak of uh, apprehensionals in the plural because there do exist grammatical morphemes which can be used to express 
fear. Uh, and these can be found both in the nominal domain, so the nouns, um, as case inflections, and also in the verbal domain, uh, the so-called uh, lest clause construction. Um, first, let's take a look at the um, aversive case, which is uh, the gra grammatical morpheme um, in, the in the nominal domain. So, aversive case inflections are descriptive. Uh, there is uh, this example uh, from Yidini, which is an Aboriginal Australian language, where you have the suffix uh, Yida uh, as a marker of aversive nominal case. Um, it has scope over the noun phrase, expresses fear that is not necessarily that of the speaker, but maybe that of the agent of the main clause. And here is an example um, from Dixon, uh, mother is frightened of the dog. So as you can see in the last um, uh, word form here, Yida is a suffix marking the aversive case, right? Um, now, there is also within the verbal domain uh, the so called less clause construction. Um, in English, uh, an example would be don't go too near the fire lest you get burned. This less uh, actually goes back to a combination of uh, three uh, morphemes. Um, uh, which is thereby less than, you know, there is a very nice uh, study done uh, on that. Uh, we don't have uh, time for the details here, but the important thing is that this list, this subordinator is, um, uh, it is the result of a long grammaticalization process. Um, and uh, what you have uh, today is, um, oops, Something happened. <laughs> Did I press something? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, th this less construction um, consists of two clauses. It can encode a uh, feared or apprehension causing verb situation, which is to be avoided, whereby the feared or the apprehension causing situation is generally portrayed as counterfactual. Um, less clauses, however, um, they're not only about fear. In fact, uh, when they were first identified as grammatical expressions, that was back in 1977 by Dixon, um, they were not I mean, the, the first examples of, uh, of the less uh, uh, clause construction um, were about undesirable situations that were to be avoided. Not necessarily about fear. It was later on that more and more examples were identified. And even in, a, in an example from Kobokota, uh, actually Chambers, she, she was a student here and then she did her PhD here. Um, as you can see, this is a, uh, I mean, in this example, uh, which is, uh, you know, current, I mean, uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with the earlier stages of language. Uh, if you want to say, I've just cooked and you will eat lest you be hungry. There is nothing about fear, uh, nothing about fear here. It's really about a desirable situation. So it was only later that less clauses were identified as possible grammaticalized expressions of fear, right? Um, and in fact, recent studies of apprehensionals um, show that expressing a feared situation is only one of at least two functions of apprehensionals. Um, so this is uh, what uh, made us, uh, I mean, uh, my Korean co-authors and myself to, to, um, to propose the term avoidive especially, uh, uh, instead of apprehensionals because it's just, maybe we think it's a misnomer. If we assume that the linguistic expression of fear is basic or universal, limited variation with respect to the kind of structures that come to function as apprehension laws uh, is to be expected. But our observations uh, show that the grammaticalization paths 
that lead to apprehensionals show quite some variation. So what we have as grammaticalization paths to apprehensionals is you can have a, a, a negation, a, a construction for something negative, like, you know, like in, in English, you can have something with a involving a temporal marker. Um, then uh, you can also have um, a construction which involves uh, visual perception, um, namely the verb to see, or um, a construction which involves cognition, um, namely the verb to think. The, 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 latter two uh, come from Korean and here I'm talking about more about um, more advanced grammatical morphemes uh, for fear but especially if we take a look at less advanced let's say lexical grammatical um, expressions um, then we see even more that we observe even more a diversity of grammaticalization, lexical to grammatical developments. So it's not only negation and temporal. Here you have, uh, you know, the um, the concrete references, the concrete languages, but it's also purposive notions, manner notions. Like for instance, the the, the lexeme for order, uh, lexeme for cut or bite, or hit, or strike, or kill, or break, come, uh, accomplish, etc. that have started on the way of grammaticalization, right? Uh, but haven't reached that advanced grammaticalization status. Um, so the point is that there is variation, um, um, even, and it is even more, striking when it comes to the number of grammaticalized structures that can express fear in different languages. So la there are languages with no grammatical morpheme uh, for fear. English has no grammatical morpheme, we mentioned it less. In German, there is no such grammatical morpheme. You use the mit, but the mit is, you know, it's absolutely neutral. Um, but there are languages like Korean again, um, which has no fewer than 10 grammatical morphemes <clears throat> for fear, right? They are, they are, uh, they're, the extent to which they have grammaticalized is not the same. Some of them are more grammaticalized, more advanced, uh, others are not. Nevertheless, it is possible to identify no fewer than 10 of them. Um, so the variation which is observed here also indicates that there is no specific fingerprint of fear in the linguistic expression of this emotion in sentence grammar. So we're still in sentence grammar covering the domain of the lexicon and now it was the domain of grammar. We can say that the observation is one sentence grammar unit may encode more than one emotions, one expression may encode more than one emotions, fear being one of them. And fear may be encoded by more than one sentence grammar units, more than one expressions, right? So it is not possible to claim universality of a specific signature in the expression of fear within sentence grammar. Now, I told you that within Discourse grammar, you know, if you remember this uh, figure with discourse grammar on top, and then we had sentence grammar and theoretical grammar. Uh, theoretical grammar has been proposed to be evolutionary primary, uh, and in that case, more basic. We we have um, argued this um, in a couple of papers. So it seems more promising for us to look for universality, if we're looking for universality, in the expression of fear in theoretical grammar, not in sentence grammar, especially if we look at interactives. Do you remember all these bits and pieces, extra clausal, like directives and, and, and attention signals, hey, 
uh, and formulae of social exchange by hello, all these little fragments which are extremely important for, for communication, for interaction. So that's where we're going to look at now, <clears throat> hoping to find universality. Um, so expression of fear, interactives of fear across languages. It turns out that of all interactives, interjections, interjections was like, wow, oh, oh my God. Um, interjections occur most frequently as linguistic expressions of fear. And we, we, we clearly see like three types of interjections in this particular case. We have primary interjections, we have secondary interjections which derive from vocatives, um, and secondary interjections which derive from expletives. Um, there are also some evaluatives. Evaluatives, these are still interactives like right, brilliant, uh, response solicitors, like right, and directives, but they're less frequently used. So let's take a look first at primary interjections. Uh, here in Persian, you have, um, you know, you have the counterpart of the English O. Um, in Bulgarian, well, Bulgarian is my mother tongue, <clears throat> so I'm always happy to give an example. I can, I can read aloud and not feel uncomfortable. Um, so a primary interjection, it's a single word. Uh, you know, if you ask me, I don't know what it, what it can be traced back to. It's quite a long word, olele. Right, it doesn't mean anything actually. It's, it's to me at least, uh, and I don't think that uh, there is anything known about the etymology of this. Um, but translated in English, it would be oh god. Um, here is an example. Vidya kak figurati tiku se približavat kam ligloto olile, a misika kakvo, muskli ti vaka tonkova stegnati. The chak says plashi chinyama de moja de pomridne. So I'm going to, to read to you the translation. She saw the figures coming closer, quietly towards the bed. Oh God, what now? Her muscles were so stiff that she was afraid she will never be able to move. So this is an example of primary interjections. Um, we have secondary interjections, which derive from vocatives. Um, vocative is when you, it's like a term of address, like turn to someone, you know, there is a grammar special term for that vocative. So here's an example from English. I'm driving, the person A says, I'm driving, there is this big bag and the whole bonnet lit up, oh God. The person B says, oh God. Um, so this is a secondary interjection deriving from vocative, as if, as if you know, like the, 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 originally it was like um, um, asking for help, turning to God for help. Um, in Persian, you have the same thing. Uh, and interestingly, in Persian, um, you can also use the kin, uh, kinship terms for mother and father uh, in the same function as, as an expression of fear, uh, right? Um, in fact, in Bulgarian, you can also you can also use. Um, uh, uh, I'm, st I'm still I'm still here <laughs> in Bulgarian. You can also word the you can also use the word for for mother, uh, and you use it in fact in the diminutive uh, as an expression of, of fear. Um, I know in Italian you can also say "Mamma mia!" Also, when you are um, uh, in fearful situation. The third type of uh, interjections uh, derive from expletives. This is a very rich <laughs> source for, um, for, I mean, for expressions of fear in English. You see some of them, um, I'm sure you know more. Uh, there is one, um, one uh, example here from Spanish. Uh, also arriving, uh, deriving from expletive, ex expletives in Bulgarian. Uh, okay, so expletives, uh, I think um, it's, it's a clear case. Um, now, another type of interactive, in addition to, uh, to, uh, to uh, interjections, um, is evaluatives. 
So uh, that's a, uh, an example of Bulgarian from Bulgarian. Uh, here you can use the uh, the noun horror um, uh, in a I mean uh, in a fearful situation. I'm not going to, to go through the example because as I as I can see, uh, we don't have that much time. Um, then we have response solicitors. Uh, these two can be used uh, um, as, um, that's another example from Bulgarian. There is a combination of two particles, da and ne. Uh, and if you want to say, you sound weird, are you sick? You don't have a cold, right? Um, so that would be uh, a response elicitor, but this, um, this is also, um, something that can be used uh, in, in a fearful situation. Um, so what we can say is that in interactive grammar, interjections are the most commonly used linguistic realizations of fear. However, there is no one-to-one -one match between one particular interjection and the emotion of fear in individual languages. There are more than one interjection that can express fear. And on the other hand, the same interjection can express several emotions. So we have the same correlations here. And that's another example from Bulgarian where you can see um, that, um, you know, there are no fewer than five nouns uh, which, when they're used in their vocative case form, um, can be used uh, as expressions of fear. These nouns are uh, God, um, and you see the vocative form for God is absolutely different, you know, uh, uh, not very different, but it's, it's a distinctive form. Bog is the unmarked form, Bože is the marked form. Anyway, it's, it's a clear distinction uh, that you have a vocative case. And interestingly enough, um, this can be used not only in fearful situations, but also in order to express um, um, uh, um, joy. Right, so again, we have a combination of both negative but also positive emotion uh, encoded in one and the same uh, interactive, in this case, interjections. Um, so, same thing with uh, evaluative uh, interactives and same thing with responsive response elicitors. So, we can say that we find no evidence for the existence of a specific fingerprint within the domain of interactive grammar as well, where we actually hoped that uh, it will be much more feasible for us to, um, uh, you know, to find some universality. Um, okay, so we're passing on to the next section, which is uh, an attempt at a bigger picture of, of the whole situation of linguistic realization of fear across languages. Um, so as you uh, could see, we, we I mean, um, we examined uh, several geographically and genetically related and unrelated languages here. Uh, and we note, but we observe that fear does not have a specific linguistic fingerprint or signature. Rather, um, it is a way to be part of a culture using the words uh, of, of Batya Mesquita uh, in a very interesting recent book that she uh, she wrote. But I mean, she's a, um, a cultural anthropologist and psychologist, but here we as linguists can also say that. Uh, and interestingly enough, this puts us in a position to make predictions or a verifiable hypothesis. For instance, we do not expect that the people living on the island of Bali in Indonesia have specific interactive vocalization to express fear for the following reason. Now, when I say interactive vocalization, you remember we, we talked about interactives uh, when, when you skate, oh my God, right? Or something like that, like this, oh, wow. Um, but 
in, in the example that I'm going to, um, to give you now from Bali, we have a very different situation. When people living on the island of Bali are afraid, they are reported to fall asleep. Or at least that's what they're supposed to do. According to Barrett, that's a construction theory, Falling asleep might seem like a strange thing to do when you're afraid. If you're from a Western culture, you're supposed to freeze on the spot, widen your eyes and gasp. You can also squeeze your eyes shut and scream like a teenage babysitter in a bad horror movie. Or you can run away from whatever is scaring you. These behaviors are Western stereotypes, stereotypes for proper fear behavior. In Bali, the stereotype is to fall asleep. Now, if we have this as linguists, knowing, I mean, having made the observations that we, that we made, we actually, we, we, can, we can formulate this hypothesis that there you wouldn't expect um, a specific interactive vocalization. We haven't we haven't checked that, but it's <laughs> it'll be extremely interesting, you know, to, to do research there. As I mentioned, I have to repeat it again. It's a pilot study. Now, when it comes to the experience of fear, are we as analysts of language in position to either prove or disprove its universality? across languages and cultures. Even in cases where an individual language has a linguistic expression for fear, how can we be sure that the users of that language have the same concept of fear as the users of another language? Here is an example for the role of culture in conceptualization of the emotion of fear. In, in Indonesian, there is a distinction made between two forms, two lexemes. One of them is geri and the other one is takut. The first one, geri, is used for fear of things. For example, fear of heights, fear of things and objects. Then you would express geri. Are you a speaker of Indonesian? Because you're nodding so understandingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you like the idea, yeah, you mean? Version. Oh, I understand. Oh, I understand. Okay. <laughs> you have a very expressive face. <laughs> okay. Um, so, for fear of things uh, and objects, you use the, the form Gary. And for fear of people or of their actions, you use another one, namely Takut. Now, Spanish, German, and English have several synonyms for fear, but no such differentiation as in Indonesian exists. But can language provide us with a diagnostic tool for the existence of fear as a basic universal emotion with specific fingerprint or signature? Our observation here is that different linguistic expressions can be used to express the same emotion, and the same expression can be used to express different emotions. From a linguistic, from a linguistic perspective, we observe no specific fingerprint for fear, and this is compatible with Barrett's view of uh, her associates' uh, view of emotion. Uh, and, and because they also find that the same emotion category involves different bodily responses. None of the bodily responses are unique to one single emotion exclusively. So our observations favor definitions, uh, the, uh, favor a definition of emotions that, also, that Barrett proposes, uh, which is a way for our brain to make sense of what is happening on the basis of three sources of information, the internal physiological state of the body, interoception, the, you know, how our visceral organs are doing their state, external stimuli and individuals past experience. So it's not about, it's not like our emotions are triggered by external stimuli. It's much more complex than that. And 
This suggests that the linguistic expression of, so, and our, our study suggests that the linguistic expression of fear is culture-based. And the role of culture can be seen um, even clearly, even more clearly, if we consider um, the study uh, that I'm going to, um, to show you now, I mean, the results of which I'm going to show you now, where there is a visualization of fear proposed for two languages, English and Lithuanian. So this study, 2006, has, we have to go, Oh, okay. <laughs> what can I say? Oh, <laughs> this. <laughs> and the next one is this one it's in Lithuanian. <laughs> it's an animal. So yes. this one is a human and this one is an animal with different uh, characteristics that you can see. So that's that these are the, the, the visualizations of fear into different languages. So what we can say is that. Um, our observations favor uh, Barrett's construction theory of emotions uh, and classification into universal basic emotions. Fear included is Western based. Culture plays critical role in how fear is constructed and expressed in language. People of the same culture express themselves in similar ways. People from different cultures may express feelings or thoughts differently. This does not contradict the fact that there are also similarities between the fears across languages. And the reason is that there are similarities between the historical, religious and cultural elements of different cultures. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs>